Good morning, everybody, and uh, I'm very pleased to, to be here. So we better just start properly. Sorry, it's not quite on the same on the screen here as uh, on there. There's too much going on. Right, I'd like to talk to you this morning about this wonderful site at Carnoustie and how we're putting the evidence together about its its story, the story of people actually living on the site. And in piecing the evidence together, as I'm going to show you, I hope you'll, you'll get a glimpse of our sort of methodology and our, our thinking behind uh, what we do. This slide shows the position, which is the red square, of the site of of Carnoustie on the 30 metre uh, contour. This isn't, this is a, a contour of a raised beach from the Devonian uh, period. So it's quite an old raised beach. You can see from the photograph that the, the present day coastline isn't very far, it's only just over uh, a kilometre away. There's the red uh, sorry, the, the green strip a little bit to the right of the site where there's fresh water. The, the site is elevated. It had woodland around it, mainly oak. Uh, there would be mature oak with alder and hazel. You've just heard about alder and hazel here in, in Edinburgh. During the life of the site, there was also apple and also heather type uh, vegetation. But the oak is primarily the most important species for the site. It was used both structurally and also uh, for fuel, along with alder as well. One thing I must also point out to you that um, you know this is a, a south southeasterly facing um, aspect, but it's actually on some of the most important soils, some of the best soils in Scotland. So people chose this site well, and I should just say location, location, location is very important here. This slide shows the, the main features that we have located on the site, and I've divided it up into two groups. Um, the first group here are the structures, the main structures, and I'm going to be discussing some, some of these. You can see they're grouped together. There are other areas highlighted which show external activity to those buildings. We also have a group along the other edge of the raised beach, which we're still investigating. And this big area beyond, I shall come to a bit later on. So we're talking about Neolithic, and we're also talking about the Bronze Age. And in fact, the Neolithic is predominantly early Neolithic. These are the four structures I'm going to be talking about. One early Neolithic hall, a second one lurking inside a third and a Bronze Age structure related quite closely to a very important metalwork hoard that we found during the course of the excavation. Now, my colleague um, Alan Hunter Blair that actually excavated the site uh, with um, our other archaeologists, took a lot of the aerial photographs I'm going to show you today. And I'm really pleased that I have uh, the opportunity to show you some, some of these. Now, this is the earliest structure, or structure 13. Sorry, it's not the earliest. That is still in debate. But I'm starting uh, from the west, working eastwards, and it's the first one I'm, I'm talking about. We have basically a long rectangular shape 
with rounded ends. You can see post holes, you can see half pits. But this is an unusual building because it has an annex on one side. Um, what is also important here is its relationship to another, the other buildings here and the devastation in a way that rig and furrow during the post-medieval period and also drains, modern drains, have actually made uh, to this, this settlement that we have. Structure 13 looks fairly simple, but it isn't. I've put on the radiocarbon dates. You can see there's some very early ones. We were just being told about around about um, 4000 BC, the first inhabitants settled Neolithic farmers were coming <coughs> into this country. We have early dates here and in the other buildings I'm going to show you. We have a problem, and that is that farming has removed a lot of evidence from this site. Our pits and post holes are quite shallow, uh, barely 20 centimetres uh, on average. The, the deeper ones are the fire pits, where we have most evidence. And from other structures, I would have expected more cultural and environmental evidence, but actually it's quite, quite thin from this site. And animal, animal bone has virtually not survived unless it was uh, cremated. So this image shows you the main types of artefacts we have and, and some of the environmental evidence. And the most important aspect of this building is that it had high numbers of cereals. In contrast to all the other structures on the excavation, most of the cereals were found here. And you can see the slightly darker green triangles. So we know that in sometime in the early Neolithic, people were farming on probably on the, this raised beach area, producing both wheat and barley. Now, these early dates are also very comparable to other structures in this area on the, on the east coast of Scotland. Uh, we have recently published Alison Cameron's work at Kirkton Fair Teresso, and these um, early dates are very comparable to the, the structures she's been finding there and also to the, the famous site at Balbriding. So, in analysing the partial remains of the building, we are struggling to find out more about its structure. We know there were oak posts, we know there were fire pits, we can see divisions, we're not quite certain where the exterior walls were, we know it's been added onto and there have been changes around one end, but whether we get the full story or not, I'm not, not sure at this, at this point. Now, some of the pottery is not particularly <coughs> well preserved because it's been highly burnt. I was quite surprised one when I was analysing the pottery in some of these uh, fire pits that really I couldn't even show you a picture of it. It's so badly burnt and distorted and that's one of the better early Neolithic carinated uh, sherds found in this site. Now I'm, a I'm going to start puzzling here we have an all-over uh, corded beaker. Now, where's this from? <laughs> Which migrant group has brought this in? <laughs> so, you know, it, it's important to think about these things. Um, so, we have a certain amount of evidence. We have to work with that evidence to actually tease out the story of what is happening with that particular building, how long it was in use for, what it was used for, and its relationship with the other structures. This 
photograph I particularly like. It shows to me the slightly elevated position on the raised beach of this very long wooden uh, hall. You can see the, that the sea isn't very far away. Um, and you can also see the fact that these rig and furrow marks have gone through the building at awkward points in it because they've probably gone through where the doorways were and have um, sort of damaged some of the internal partitioning of the, of the structure. But before I get on to the larger hall, the larger timber hall, I want to, you to have a look at this inside it. You can see the darker gullies, post holes and pits in the background of the larger hall. And again, we have a wooden building. Again, we have early dates, 3-9, Another one up here. We're, we're talking, you know, are we talking about some sort of uh, contemporary structures? It's one following another, and we're going to certainly have to have a look at some sort of more detailed analysis of our radiocarbon dates to actually find out whether these buildings are contemporary or whether ones follow another. This is reasonably well preserved. Again, oak and alder were used in its construction. Um, willow wood was found here, hazelnut shells, some heather, and a very few cereals, again, wheat and barley. But it's quite a small building. It's uh, only about 15 meters long. You can see its rough outline. We can see there's one division here. We, we certainly have um, burrowing from um, probably badgers or rabbits. Um, not entirely clear whether this is remains of the rig and furrow system. But at least we have some sort of pattern. We, we, can, have the dis we can see the distribution of artifacts. This building actually has pitch stone. And while I was putting these slides together, I, I've noted where an axe has come from, but also a whetstone. Now, this axe is extremely nice. Uh, Alison Sheridan has examined this. This is a local stone, probably from the Highland area. It's a, a garnet albite schist. It's a most unusual stone for, for an axe. More unusually, Alison has considered that this axe is totally unused and it may have been deposited deliberately in the pit in which it was found. Well, my question is, does it link up with this rather large stone of blonde, fine-grained sandstone, which has certainly been used in its... Uh, in the middle of the stone there. So am I thinking that was that stone actually polished and the edge sharpened, sorry, the axe polished and sharpened on a stone like this that was found just a few metres away from it? That's something we have to think about and consider. Some of the pottery from this small building is also very interesting. It's, I think, the first time I've ever had to analyse a pot that is completely unfired and it has survived and it has survived because it was in a pit and because it was highly burnished so it had a good solid outer surface to it um, it has organic material in it it is very very fragile but it's rather remarkable that we have this early neolithic pot um, surviving as it has in those four large pieces we have unusual pottery. Yes, part of the Neolithic, early Neolithic suite of 
early carinated bowls, but with an exaggerated carination or lip. It also shows a perforation that was put in before the, the um, pot was fired, which is interesting. So it's not, they're not just, suspend, uh, not just putting the round bottom bowl in the hearth ashes, they're actually suspending this bowl higher up, possibly above the flames. This is, it may not look particularly interesting, but to me this is a very nice piece of pottery. Instead of a carination, it has a little lug, a little lens-shaped <coughs> lug, a little tiny handle. It may have had another three or four of those around it, um, around the, the circumference of the vessel. And I've highlighted here the organic material that was used in the clay and the fact that it has burnt out during firing to leave these ves vessel vesicles in, in the clay. And you can clearly see uh, some of those there. Now moving on to the, the larger building. This is probably the largest or one of the largest timber halls in Scotland. It's over 35 metres long. I hope you can see part of its outer timber, structural timbers and or walls here. You can see divisions, the end, there's more divisions and fire pits. It, the pattern of this building is reasonably straightforward. That is, until you realise, yes, well, there's, there's this other building sat in the middle of it, and what's the relationship? Did one replace the other? When? How? Which is earlier? Which is later? We don't know just at the moment. But also, during the Bronze Age, we had another building dug on top of it, which has complicated matters somewhat. And this is the location of the hoard. There is actually another Bronze Age building here, but these are important aspects to the story of the survival of this building. It's a bit, little bit like <laughs> island dynamics. The further away you go from something, the less you have of it. But if we have fewer organic remains here. We have fewer cereals. The, the lithic artefacts are few and far between. The pitch stone, one or two pieces. Whether this is a product of a, being a slightly later building, I don't know, but we've still got early dates around this particular building that have come from its uh, structural post holes. What this building had in comparison to the others is more pottery. You can see the density of vessels uh, highlighted on, on this slide. And <coughs> yes, here. This is the, the whetstone, possibly related to the axe, but was also found together with two saddle querns in a pit which is an interesting deposition of very useful stones. So why they were put there, whether it is an actual d deliberate deposition, I'm not too sure. So there's not much more I can say about this. It has a very long history, if, it, if this is the case, uh, whether some walls were extended, rebuilt, altered, it's something we still have, have to work with. Some of the pottery from this building was exceptional in quality. These are all early Neolithic uh, sherds from round-bottomed bowls. Now, unlike the previous example, this hole, this is the reverse, this is the inside of the pot as opposed to the exterior, um, they decided to put a hole in after it had fired and unfortunately must have hit a rather large piece of um, temper, uh, quartz temper, and the pot broke at that point and probably was discarded. But it was highly burnished. Uh, this too is another highly burnished pot, but it's also corky. The, 
the organic material has come out, is burnt out and left these, these holes within it. This is a particular favourite of mine. Uh, another technique that the potter used was once the pot was finished, they dragged their fingers down it to create ridges uh, that made the pot look nice. It's highly burnished as well. So we're talking about a variety of pots of different sizes, cooking pots, perhaps e uh, drinking vessels. The, there's a lot going on that we still need to tease out uh, more of the story from this particular um, site. Now I'm going to move on to the Bronze Age, to this rather ephemeral building and its link possibly with the hoard, the big the red dot in the middle of the other structures. Now just to put um, these into context, this has radiocarbon dates from the early right through to the, the late Bronze Age. Structure one here, another Bronze <coughs> Age building, is late Bronze Age in date. Structure three is middle <coughs> to late Bronze Age. This one is early to middle Bronze Age. And this one didn't have any dates at all because it had no organic material. So these are not all contemporary buildings, and with wooden buildings, you wouldn't perhaps expect them to be particularly long-lived. We excavated most of this site on a, on a grid system. Perhaps just see the, um, the string creating the grid there. To me, it's rather ephemeral in comparison to the long timber hall, which it overlies. You can see some of the post holes and pits from the long timber hall. There are neat post holes on this side of the Bronze Age building, <coughs> some stone on this. The rest is, is hard to, to make out. But what is important is this dark, shaded bit uh, uh, against one arc of its circumference, which is this material here. Well, we were lucky enough to get uh, radiocarbon dates from it. Um, it, it. It's very different from, from the other structures in that its range of wood species, uh, probably reflecting changes in the local environment, were quite different from, from the Neolithic buildings. We had birch, oak, alder, hazel, heather, heather types, also cherry, possibly elm, and there was certainly apple somewhere on the site as well. So, but the environmental evidence is quite slim. The numbers of cereal are few and far between. The flint and the pottery, which I haven't even highlighted on here, are all from the disturbed building, the Neolithic building underneath. Uh, all the pottery was early Neolithic car carinated wares. So it's a bit of a mix, and to sort out what went with each, with each building it is quite complicated. So this is the occupation layer within the building, and in contrast to the others, some larger stone tools were found here. Um, in particular, some large, larger quartz flakes from large cobbles had been smashed and obviously used as, as cutting implements or, or something like that. But we also had a rather nice arc of a cannel coal bangle. Uh, again, Alison Sheridan has analysed this, and this was found in a pit in the occupation layer, very close to where the hoard uh, is or was. Um, now, the other stone tools are, are different because we haven't found these in any of the Neolithic uh, buildings. We have a perforated stone. Is it a spindle whirl? Is it a weight for a drill? That has to be analysed a little bit more. We have a number of pebble or cobble polishers, what I'm calling poli polishers, of which you see two here. 
This is the underside of uh, one of the, the stones. And it's smooth, it's hollowed out, it's been used to polish something hard. What, I don't know, whether it's, other, whether it's metal work, I'm not too sure at this stage. This stone is very unusual. It's a very hard, metamorphic um, stone. But you can see there's two shadows here where both sides have been heavily worn. So it's heavy stone, dense stone, but somebody's favorite tool because of that use that that stone has had. Well, it makes me wonder whether in fact somebody was using that building as a workshop. Uh, we don't have much evidence to suggest any other type of activity happening there. Now I'm not particularly going to talk about the hoard. The hoard's been uh, spoken about before and but I just to, to show you that the radiocarbon dates from the hazel um, scabbard of the sword actually match very closely uh, with um, the later Bronze Age date of, the, of that structure I've just shown you. A very nice hoard. We brought it in, uh, in, a, in a block away from the site to be excavated under controlled scientific uh, conditions. And there are other objects, there's the pommel that's missing from the end of the, the sword. There is a, a bronze um, sunflower pin, sunflower-headed pin. There's gold at the end of the spearhead here. It's been conserved, it's been thoroughly under the microscope by many different specialists, by a conservator as well. And it's very similar, Alison Sheridan thinks, to a hoard found about 20 kilometres away from Carnoustie at Poitadikes. So we have some link with other activities of this special kind in the area. Now, I've, I've only talked about a small part of this, what I consider a very important, densely inhabited <coughs> site. Well, I've posed many questions, uh, questions that we still need to research, to analyse and come to, come to terms with and actually decide on what, what the story will be. So, we know there are different activities going on here. Some uh, belong to uh, some are burials. We know there's burials out in this back area beyond the habitation where we can see alignments of post holes perhaps showing where there are field boundaries or other types of boundaries. And it's really going to be very interesting to get to grips with that. Uh, again, I'm slightly worried about these all over corded beakers and where they're coming from after this morning's lecture. Uh, this is uh, quite an early one. Uh, whether it's come from, from the continent, it, well, it looks like it's highly likely at the moment. Um, that was found in a pit uh, on its own out in the, the back area of the site. We have other Bronze Age burial activity. Uh, this one's actually very interesting. It was full of human uh, remains, cremated human remains, and there's actually some animal with it as well. That's come out of this pit group, which is probably a small Bronze Age burial area. We have other types of Bronze Age funerary wares, um, probably a food vessel urn here, and this one was rather a surprise. It's rather a nasty piece of pottery until I turned it over and found that it has the impression of cloth underneath it. And that's a, a bronze, of the base of a Bronze Age urn. So there are still many questions. And especially about the cultural aspects of this site as whether it, whether, and its longevity. So. I'm afraid to say, Carl Neustie will still be under the microscope for just a little bit longer. 
Thank you very much.